And the point is that if you take measurement after measurement after measurement and you slow it a little bit, that, that you give them a bit more freedom and then new measurements and then a little bit of freedom again, then they are just so shaken that the resistance is broken. Mm. And, and, and a real dictator works that way. Mm. But, you know, I also know from some policemen personally that they hate the situation as it is now and that they hate uh, having to be sent to demonstrations, uh, anti-corona demonstrations, uh, because they say, I don't want it, but I lose everything. And if, if I show that I have pity with those people, then uh, other police against are laughing at me. So they, they keep their mouth. And I can understand that because uh, it's so difficult. You're losing so much if you are different. But there's one thing that they all, all overlook. We are living in our Western paradigm and that can only think in terms of uh, improving our cells, improving our brain. And they, they simply have no clue how great our brain is, how powerful our thoughts are, how powerful our mind is. And our soul. Um, and our soul. And that, that n they, there will never, ever be a, a robot that will get the soul of a human being. If you look at it, a part of the study guides is talking about how the technocrats look at human beings and they see human beings as the dogs of Pavlov yeah. and that you can program them and that almost robot-like. Yeah. And that's not a human being. That's not our creative potential. Yeah. And that, that's absolutely going to revolt. It will not revolt in everybody because there will always a group of people who say, this is nice. I don't need to do that much and I have my income, etc. Mm. But most people will feel the knock on the door inside yeah. of their creativity. And there are always people who find creative ways just to escape the rules. Look at what is happening now. Because they have the wrong ideas about what a human being is. Yes. They don't have an idea about the soul. Yeah. They have no idea about spirituality. Yes. It's, it's, it's all kicked out. Yeah. Uh, science has to be the, the religion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the scientist, the priest you know um it's such a revolt against what yeah. a human being really is what a soul really is what your inner authenticity really is yes. what your creativity yes. is what the power of your mind is it's simply not gonna work yes. and this is the beginning this time yes. of the blackness in the world and all these dystopian things this is the beginning this is the birth of the combining of the feminine and masculine of spirit and matter mm. and we are the we are the persons we have to give birth to that. But that's that's the development and that's why I'm so absolutely hopeful. Hello everyone, this is Batista Pap and today we have a treat for you. Today we are in the sanctuary, the beautiful sanctuary of Karen Hamaker Zondag and Karen Hamaker Zondag is a very special person. She's a great researcher. Uh, Karen, you are an astrologer. Yes. Uh, you are an expert in the Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, you studied social geography and, and, and planning. Um, you are the author of 36 books. Uh, and for over 25 years, you have been doing research on power and power structures and, and who basically controls the world. And um, I believe you have lectured all over the world um, on psychology and uh, astrology. Yes. Oh, well, it's so good to finally meet you. It's an honor uh, to meet you. Uh, we are big fans of, 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 of your work. And it's incredible if you look at, at your body of work, what you have done. And... I was wondering what drives you. What is, what is your drive? Is it curiosity? It's an, in a way, it's curiosity. But um, I want to understand how your mind ticks, yes. uh, how it works, and uh, it, it's a never-ending story. There's so much that you can do with your mind, and and uh, how your psyche adapts to the world, uh, how your vision is, but also how you react on uh, unconscious things and. It's so fascinating. And in understanding that, uh, you start to understand not only yourself, but also the world. Yes. yes. And maybe a little bit more of yourself as of well. Of course. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Especially of yourself. Yes. But, but when you understand more of yourself, 
you get more relaxed, yes. um, you get more self-acceptance, yes. and then you are more open to understand the world. Yes. Then you are not that much projecting anymore. Yes. So, so um, Karen, you are an astrologer. How long have you been into astrology? From early 70s of the last century. Oh, so that's that's 40 years. 50. 50 years. 50 now. years wow, yes. yeah, incredible. Yes. So people that I'm talking with, um, they, they've told me that there are, let's say, very powerful and influential uh, gentlemen um, and these men are very knowledgeable of how the administration of the world works and um, pe people told me that those 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 influential powerful people they base almost everything on astrology and that the administrators of the world have really high level astrologers that guide them through everything um, and I thought that's really in interesting so because they don't do anything without knowing what 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 the, the planets are, are, are um, saying. Well, uh, I don't know if everybody is doing that, yes. but I know that astrology is very well accepted in the highest circles, yes. but not only astrology. Actually, if you are in those highest circles, yes. you understand that you cannot explain everything with statistics. Yes. So they start to be open to irrational things. Yes. So I also know that people are working with the I Ching yes. and astrology and those things. Yes. yes. And can you say something about why uh, astrology is so popular in these highest circles? Well, you cannot predict precisely with yes. all these things, yes. but you can understand tendencies. Yes. And uh, it gives you warnings at, uh, and it helps you yes. to give an extra orientation. Yes. And uh, if you ask a question in astrology, uh, you can clearly see if the time is ripe for something or not, or where the dangers are. And then you have to take the decision yourself, of course. But astrology can be uh, a guide. It can be helping you to understand uh, another uh, picture than you have in your mind of something. Mm. Beautiful. Um, I, I realize um, that most people don't really understand what astrology is. Um, so could you explain, explain to us what is astrology and, 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 and why is it so important? Well, actually, astrology... Uh, it tells about the relationship, yeah. about the movements in heaven and uh, what is happening on earth. Yes. And it started in uh, the old Mesopotamian Babylonian yes. times where they observed the heavens and they saw the planets, which they didn't understand that were planets at yes. that time, They, but they saw those moving objects uh, in heavens and they noted where they were uh, and they also wrote down what happened on earth yes. and after centuries they started to discover that every time when a certain planet that they called Ninurto or Nergash or whatever yes. was there and there they saw this kind of things is happening at earth so they yes. saw a correlation and they didn't think about influence they thought a correlation yes. and they started to study those correlations and uh, because they considered the planets as gods yes. um, they they saw the, the the movement of the planets as the writing of the gods in heaven and a message of the gods. And they said, if we can understand what the gods want to tell us, we can communicate with the gods and and start to negotiate a different fate. Yes. And so they, they never have believed there is just a fate, but they believed that they could negotiate with the gods yes. uh, as soon as they understood that language. And so from, th from 3000 BC yes. until... Um, actually the Greek time they have done this yes. they have written this down and they have we have clay tablets in which yes. we can read how they uh, wrote it down and how their omen their, their, yes. their, their predictions were yes. and and so that, that was the first beginning simply watching what is happening there and what is happening here okay. and actually from that body of knowledge yes. uh, Western uh, astrology has developed and I think that astrology is actually one of the earliest methods of mankind yes. to get to understand some kind of order yes. in the seemingly chaos around him. Yes. And in every uh, culture, yes. uh, the relationship between heaven and earth has played a role. And, yes. and, and, and slowly the techniques were more sophisticated and developed yes. and yes. new influences came, new, new ideas came. But there is, is the beginning. Yeah. And so th there is no 
influence of the of the stars as people say mm -hmm. many people think that astrologers believe that the, that the stars are having you in their power which mm -hmm. is not true yeah. because there was a, a something happened um the, the the axis of the earth is tilted yes. and so we have that tilted um, movement around yes. the sun yes. but it's not only tilted the axis of the earth itself makes a very slow movement yes. itself and and makes this movement in about 26,000 years yes. and it means that now the axis is directed to the pole star yes. but it won't be that long anymore because it's moving away yes. but that means that it's moving away one degree in 72 years oh. and it means that the Babylonians having studied this 3,000 years yes. uh, they got confused at a certain point because yes. they saw that somehow uh, those those planets yeah. came in different sections yes. and, uh, and 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 so they they had noted down what kind of things could happen and there was a kind of shift and the greek came and they solved this problem and they said well we are not going to take um the real stars as a background yes. but um we take the the year of the sun the sun yes. uh, we, we 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 the earth evolves around the sun yes. uh in its orbit and we divide that orbit in 12 equal pieces and we call that the signs of the zodiac and it's 360 degrees and now we measure the planets against that zodiac so it's an artificial zodiac and that means that there is no influence um but then you see that science, nowadays science says, oh, then it can't be, then it's just rubbish. But that's the scientific paradigm of this moment um, that, once, that, that we can only think in, in causality. Something must have a cause and then you have an effect. But there's an other way of thinking also. And that's more the, the, the former Easter way of thinking that says that everything that is born in the same time shares the same time quality and is expressing a same uh, energy and that means that if the planets are there at a certain time and you are born in that time that those two happenings share the same time quality and so you can read from this from the from the planets not their influence on you but it's it, it's a kind of clock on which you can look okay it's that time for me mm. and so the, the old um, Eastern way of thinking is that every time has its own meaning, its own quality. But in the West, we see time just as ticking, just moments, and it has no quality. And if you look at astrology from that Western perspective, you cannot explain that it works. If you look from it from the Eastern perspective, then you can understand that uh, simply in this time quality of the birth of a person, there was something that happened on earth, there was something that happened in heaven, and it all shares the same energy. And I can give you a kind of <clears throat> anecdote about that, that um, uh, a, 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 a befriended astrologer got uh, a daughter, and he phoned me and he said, um, I, 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 my daughter is born, and he was, of, of course, congratulations, etc. And he talked about uh, the, the, the situation on heaven of that day. And that day there was a conflict in heaven uh, between Mars and Pluto. And Mars is an energetic planet. And if that is dominant in a chart, uh, the, the child uh, needs to, to, to show a lot of energy. And Pluto is intensifying that and can even, can even overreact, but can also be somebody who can be a Kung Fu fighter. So it can be positive, can be negative. You can't see that from a chart. Now, what happened is that that conflict was in heaven. So we said, it's quite something, this child. And that day, there was almost an accident at sea. There was a ship, uh, an, an oil tanker, uh, and that um, that had difficulties with maneuvering. And it was just, uh, just a few meters away from, uh, an, a, how do you call it, an oil island in, in sea. Now, if that ship had touched it, it would have given a big fire, like, like the Brent fire. And uh, it was also the same day that um, Khomeini had spoken the fatwa on Salman Rushdie. So it was quite a day. And then at the end of the day, we, at the telephone, we were, we were talking and we said, OK, the ship was very close to, the, to that um, island, but uh, that, that artificial island for oil. 
and I forgot the name, uh, and but it didn't touch it. And so the quality of this time is this danger, but it's not going to be fulfilled. And so our conclusion was Salman Rushdie will be will stay alive, and the daughter will be quite a handful, but it's not a problem. And until now, we were right. Mm -hmm. And that's that way of looking. So oh. you see the time quality. Uh, for, uh, but, you know, if I tell this to Western people, they say, she's psychotic, you know. Mm. How can you see that? But it's it's just um, seeing the, the different uh, yes. signals of the time quality. Yes. And for an astrologer, he understands the time quality of a constellation. Oh. But it's not that you are... Um, that you that the time quality only says this and this is going to happen and nothing else. Yes. You know there is an, 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 a field of meaning that a yes. field of possibilities, yes. and you have to develop your character. You take your own decisions, yes. and that means that two people with the same horoscope still can develop into different personalities because of the choices they make yes. in developing a part of the chart or a part of the chart not. Yes. So can you make the distinction of what you actually can predict with astrology and what you cannot predict with astrology? For instance, we are now here just outside of Amsterdam and maybe people who know that you're an astrologer come to you and say, hey, Karen, can you please tell me if Ajax will be champion of the Netherlands this year? That's not how you can use astrology, of course. No, yeah. you, you see possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and we have the birth chart, yeah. um, which tells you what is actually um it, it, your your blueprint uh and it's it's uh, you, you you can see it as the drawing of a house that you still have to build and you can uh you you can make the choice to use bad materials or good materials and that's one thing and the other thing is that if you have your birth chart that is a planetary pattern the sun moon and the planets but everything in heavens moves and it means that it moves through your chart and sometimes it will come in a spot where it touches another planet. And then you know if this energy and that energy come together, then you will be in this time quality with these kind of things that can happen, these inner workings, these next steps in your development. But you still don't know what exactly is going to happen. You only see those options and you know that this is the, 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 the field of meanings you are in now. Mm. It's, it seems as if your psyche now wants you to experience a certain kind of things or read certain kinds of mm. things or meet certain kinds of people just to make the next step in your uh, development. That's the second part of astrology. Mm. There's a third part of astrology. That's what we call horary astrology. And that is the, 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 the type of astrology we use to study um, world situations, uh, charts of countries uh, and answering questions. So if somebody is uh, asking me a question, uh, I can note down the time of that question. And uh, then the chart is the birth of that question. And the chart gives indications if it's more favorable or less favorable. But if it's less favorable, favorable it, it not always says no. But it, it, it can be if, if it's less favorable and you can win, maybe you're not happy with that you mm. have been won, mm. you know. So uh, they, they, in my experience, there is nothing that is fully uh, uh, already predicted and, and mm. fully fixed in heavens. Mm. Mm. So there's always, uh, it is always a moving. There's always mm. some kind of freedom. But there's one thing that is that um, somehow, and that's what I think so is fas so fascinating, that if people ask me a certain question which is important for them, for, for psychology or, or whatever, a decision to be taken, then you very, very, very often see that they ask that question in that moment that uh, is totally in accordance with what is going on in their chart, mm. as if somehow their unconscious knows mm. the time mm. when to ask the question. Mm. That's fascinating. Wow. I, I think it's also very fascinating, and, and this is of course more to the personal astrology. Some people are born at a certain day, at a certain time, and they have incredible successful lives. And they don't seem to be working so hard for it. There's like an effortlessness behind it. And there are other people who are maybe born at another time and another day, and they have really hard lives. They work hard, they do their best to try to be successful, and things just don't come of the crown. So can you talk a little bit about that, that some people seem to be born for success and other people struggle all their lives? 
you know, um, it depends on what you define as success. Yes. And if you define it as worldly success, then you see big difference differences. But uh, I don't know if everybody who is uh, successful in society has peace of mind. And you also see people who have peace of mind uh, and don't have the success that we see as success. Yes. And there's another thing to it. It's so beautiful. I think that if you understand your chart, you understand what is your dynamic and what your psyche wants to live. And we are not always conscious of that. And I've spoken once to, um, it was about 30 years ago, but it was very interesting, with a lawyer in America. And his chart was, um, well, if, if you look at, at the chart, you see that there is, are combinations of planets and you can draw lines. There are certain uh, combinations that belong together. And you have different colors. And the red color is that when uh, it's, it is a tense uh, combination. And his chart was full of tension. And so I, I, I asked him um, uh, what he did with that tension and how he felt about that. And he told me that, yes, he knew that there was tension in him and he knew the tension. But he said, uh, you know, I cannot live without. Mm. And that's he, you know. And uh, and so he was one of the one of the first lawyers who dared to defend um, black people in the time that there was still class segregation in America mm. and they have burned down his house so he really encountered a lot of, 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 of problems and struggle but at the same time he said I would do it again because I need that that adrenaline I need that struggle I need that 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 that's what I need to to feel to be alive mm. so uh, if you look from from a distance, you say, oh, this man, he has to struggle so much. And look, his house burned down. But looking from an outside, you still don't know how people feel in themselves. Mm. And I know people who are poor and who make the most of their life because they, they are really um, uh, balanced and they are happy and they are creative. Mm. And I know people... Uh, who are rich and who are not happy. Oh, I'm thinking, so. so how would you then define success? Is that for you uh, happiness, peace of mind, alignment with the soul? Is that success to you? Yes, I don't, I, I won't, for me, I won't define it in what we in society use as the word of success. And I think the word of success isn't even the right word. You know, I, I think that when you, when you come close to yourself, to your own authenticity, to your own creativity, and you dare to live that, um, then you are happy, no matter what happens. So is success then um, um, realizing what your original personal blueprint is and living according to that? Yes, if you want to define it that way, is then, then uh, if you make your life to a success in that way, yeah. is that you live your potential. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, some people have a gift for music, like, you know, Mozart, of course, he had a father that really was very strict and, and taught him from a very early age, but he had a gift for music. Um, and, and and some people have a gift for a certain sport. Um, can you talk a little bit, how, how can people um, discover, maybe through astrology, what their gift is? Um, in astrology, you can see um, that... Uh, you have a talent for certain things, yes. but you cannot see uh, to what extent or okay. to what level. Yes. Because the, the chart doesn't tell uh, if you're going to uh, to be rich because of that. Yes. Uh, the chart simply tells that if you live this potential from yourself, uh, it it's the fulfillment of your life. Yes. And so I cannot say from a chart if somebody will be famous or not. Yes. And even if somebody will is becoming famous, I it, it maybe uh, it, it he doesn't care. He, he it, because it's not uh, he's not um, uh, in a, his personality uh, doesn't care about being famous or not. Yes. So that's what you cannot see. But I think that astrology tells me about your psyche. Uh, your blueprint, but um, in our society we think that we are totally individuals, uh, but we are not. We are we are part of a chain of ancestors, and in that chain of ancestors, 
uh, there have been problems that have not been solved. There have been talents that have not been if, uh, developed. And somehow you see in a whole chain, it can be six, seven, eight, nine generations. It, and it comes down and all of a sudden it seems that heaven says, okay, now it's over. We have to do something with it. So now is a child born and it has to live that talent. And a child will feel different from the world, feel different from its family, because there's a huge energy coming through that child. And in the chart, you can see which children do carry issues of their ancestral line. But still, they are to decide what they are going to do with it. And uh, so I cannot see if somebody is going to be very famous or not. Okay. But, but I can see what somebody needs okay. to fulfill its potential. Okay, so it's not like someone like Alexander the Great or Napoleon Bonaparte. They had different kind of astrology, uh, astrology charts. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen I, it. I yeah. haven't seen okay. it. Okay, yeah. so but it, it is not the case that you can see when someone is born because of the time and the place and the date that oh, this is going to be the next Alexander the Great or something. That's not. That's not possible. I cannot do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's that's something that people think that yeah. astrology yeah. is. So so for for people who who want to you know more want to learn more about their own astrology what would you recommend that they start to do is there a book that you would recommend or something Actually, else that you would recommend th there is so much and there's also also so much on the internet and there is yes. so much rubbish also Absolutely. and there are so many beautiful things also that i think that i look for a good astrologer and start uh, getting lessons there and what really, really important is start in a structured way, yes. just building blocks. Because what I see if, if I get students that some have been uh, reading around and, and yes. a lot of things and, and they are losing sight on what you really have to do to become a good astrologer. Yes. And they, they start totally anew. And I said, first, you have to learn this, then that, then that. And only then you can do that. So start learn it in a structured way. Then yes. it, you, it keeps you motivated and you don't get lost. Karen, you have written 36 books. If people want to learn more about astrology, is there one book of, one book of yours that you would recommend and say, okay, start with that book? Um, I, I, I have one book in Dutch. Yes. Most of the books are in Dutch. Uh, and uh, th there's one little booklet uh, about um, astrology for now that only tells you what you can do with astrology and not. Uh, it's called the Yellow Series, yeah. uh, a series of books. But that's directly uh, starting to do the interpretation. Yes. So there's not one book that, that, that combines all. It's impossible. You have to, every detail uh, has a lot of information. So that's the yellow series, actually. Well, Karen, just before uh, the interview, we were talking about Carl Jung. And um, there was a beautiful qu quote you used. And you said, uh, power appears where love disappears. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because it's so powerful. Yes, that's a, a sentence from Jung that I came across very early. And I, I, I became so curious, how is this working? And what what makes that love is disappearing, and what is what what kind of power um, is then appearing? And that's actually an external form of power. That if love disappears, then um, you tend to want to have power over other people. When love is still there, you want to have power over yourself and over your own life. So the projection of that power hunger to others is when love disappears. Yes. It's also because maybe you're not in alignment with your soul anymore. Um, uh, I, I interviewed Eckhart Tolle in 2012 and uh, I interviewed him in his holiday home in Salt Spring Island in British Columbia. And there were no books, but there was only one book in his living room and it was, you have it here too, the Red Book. Then and it, it was even a bigger version than this one. It was a really big, 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 big version of the Red Book. You have a very big ver version here too. And he said, this is what I'm studying. And you, we know, of course, like I told the power of now. Mm -hmm. um, why is this such an important book, the Red Book? The Red Book is, has been, uh, it, it's not really a book that is written by Jung. It, it, it has, it, it born from his imaginations. Yes. And when Jung and Freud split, um, uh, Jung came in a kind of 
uh, empty world. His his inner world was full was fully alive, yeah. but he lost most of his friends. Uh, he lost his position in in, in the academic world, and. Uh, he, and he, he felt that he was different from what Freud wanted to teach. And in that period, he was afraid of becoming psychotic because he felt the pressure of images coming up in him. And at that time, they really believed that if a person f had so much inner images, that that person was on the verge of becoming schizophrenic or psychotic. So he really was afraid that something was going to be wrong with him. And... Um, but he couldn't stop the images. And then, in a December evening, he decided to sit down and just let it go. He couldn't repress it anymore. And uh, and from that moment on, uh, he did it very often. And he just said, I'm, I'm just looking, I'm just looking, I'm writing down, I'm just looking. And that in the, in, in the beginning, he wrote it down in, 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 uh, in, in black... Um, I don't know the, the English word, but in a little black book that is this. Yes. It's also a, a reprint of that. And uh, later, uh, he decided to have him made just a, a, a folio, a, a letter with blank pages, mm. and to put therein all his inner dialogues, yes. his images. Uh, if he couldn't put it in words, he was drawing it, so it's full of drawings. Yes. And you see, uh, that's a lot of inner work. And he discovered that... There were elements in his soul that have a life of its own. And he had just, it was 2012, 1912, 1913, yeah. that it all start, started. And in 1903, 1909, he had had a dream uh, in which he actually had the first idea of that peop that we as a mankind don't have only a personal unconscious with your complexes but also a collective unconscious with collective memories yes. and and collective uh, uh, contents and you see in his red book that he is discovering elements of that collective unconscious the, the old wise man man yes. uh, his anima and um, and you see this is actually the, the real birth of Jungian psychology and he, he has been um, doing this active imagination, he, he developed that technique until 1929. Uh, then he got a book from Richard Wilhelm, the, the translator of the, the I Ching, um, on uh, Chinese alchemy, uh, the golden flower, secret of the golden flower. And then Jung understood that what was in that book was actually also a process he had been gone through uh, in the period that he was writing in his red book. And then mm. it ended and he started to study alchemy. But Jung once said that the years that he worked on his inner work, that he did his inner work, yes. what is reflected in the red book uh, contains all the elements he had built upon later and what became his Jungian psychology. So it's really the source of the Jungian psychology. Wow. And a source of inner work. Yes. For, for the general public, if, if you mention Carl Jung, Jung is still famous for coining the term synchronicity. And synchronicity is those moments when you think at first uh, it's a coincidence, but then if you look deeper, you know there's there's purpose, there's power, there's there's meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. um, what what is synchronicity uh, for you? Is it as important? As you know, because it's it's used so many times. Joseph Campbell uses uses it in his uh, in his work, um, and um, is 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 you know, and, and Jung is so famous for it. But do you think it's it's really important synchronicity? Yes, but um, Jung had an other opinion than most people think on it. Okay. So it's it's not a common phenomenon. It's not common. So it's uh, if if you think well, this is such a coincidence it must have a meaning that's no synchronicity okay. so synchronicity is that uh, that you experience something that you in an instant know it is meaningful oh. so you have you, you cannot project it in it it's just you have to to experience this yes. and uh, and jung says that um that when you, i have to make make another step first uh, in the deepest layer of our unconscious, we have the archetypes, and the archetypes contain uh, all the all the knowledge and all the experiences of mankind 
round uh, 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 on a certain theme. For example, uh, all the experiences with the, the, the theme of mother nourishing, uh, the bad mother, the good mother, is in that archetype. And so we have a lot of archetypes uh, that have different uh, human uh, essences. And Jung says, your complexes in your personal unconscious, um, they uh, they are built around the arc, an archetypal core. Now, those complexes, they send you images in dreams to, uh, to, to let you understand things of yourself, but they do it in images, so you must translate it to understand them. Those complexes uh, are also responsible for what we call projection. That you, for example, you see some, somebody in, uh, in the outer world and you get irritated. And then you say, yeah, I get irritated because he or she did that and that. But Jung said, no, uh, your irritation is yours. So that person is a symbol. You could consider it as a dream symbol of something that is happening in you that is not in balance in you. Mm. So you must ask yourself, what is it in me that I got irritated by that person? Mm. And so not blaming that person first go inside. That's the shadow work. That's the inner work. Yes. And that's, that's the normal way things happen. But sometimes something can happen all of a sudden and that, 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 that you meet something in the outer world of which your complex says, this is so important for you, that the moment that that happens, that you all of a sudden know in one instant, not thinking about it, but I know this is true. I know this has a meaning. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can give an example uh, of my own life. Um, um, I have the tendency to work too hard. There's so much to do. <laughs> but, but, uh, and so every couple of years, I really have to sit down and say, okay, what can I skip? Because uh, otherwise it's becoming too much. So when we were, we were married a couple of years, I had no children yet, and we were uh, working hard, had, had our jobs, but I was also in all kinds of societies and, and, and activities, etc. And those were for free so I had to work very hard to earn a living because I did so many other things for free and so it was one Sunday morning uh, that we sat together and I said wait we I have to we have to make a list of things that we can skip or can give clients to other people etc because otherwise it's it's going to be too much and so we sat down and we made a list and we talked about it and it was really good so when we were ready I said okay okay I said and I hope I can get some more some more rest and some more peace and and there was a special sentence, but I don't know how to translate it in English. But I said that. And so we had a very old radio and we always had it on a classic uh, yeah. uh, on a classic canal. And so I, I, I kicked on the radio and expecting a classical music. And it turned out that I was uh, I heard a sermon. I got, it was in the church. So and then the first thing that I heard the, 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 how did the preacher saying was, well, I hope that we can that we can get some more rest and some more peace. Those were my words. So I had said that and I heard exactly the same words from him. And at that moment, it was king and I knew. I have to take it serious because but this otherwise, is also synchronicity. Th this is synchronicity, yeah. but that is that you instantly know. But if I had sat down and said, "Hmm, that's curious that he said that," that's no synchronicity. Yeah. So the synchronicity always has to give that emotion of an instant knowing. So it has to be immediate. Immediate, yeah. and people think that synchronicity is something like something paranormal or or that's yeah. a kind of things. Or if you think it's meaningful, that that is synchronicity. But yeah. what Jung really meant is that it's not synchronicity. And what he also says, and that because why is that emotion so important? He says that in synchronicity, uh, that complex that is actually um, that it, that is around that archetypal core, and in a synchronistic event, that archetypal core is just in a, in a split second connected to the deepest layer of the unconscious, where the, the whole development that 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 your what you are meant to be is is there. Um, you are, it, it, it's, it's the movement of the cosmos is there. It's, it's your connection to the world is there. So uh, you are actually for one split second uh, in accordance uh, with a bigger movement of the cosmos, of yourself, etc. Yeah. And that's what <gasps> gives this. And that's when we feel and expansion. That's, and that is an yeah. almost religious experience. Yes. And then you know that you must not fall back in old yeah. behavior because you yeah. have to continue in a new way. Yes. And and so 
Jung really meant that with synchronicity and not uh, a, a kind of, uh, oh, this is so coincidental, it must be synchronicity. Did he also mean like the, 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 the holistic oneness uh, experience that you have at that moment? Um, he didn't mention it that way, but uh, but you can deduct it from yes. Yes. the way he describes it. Yes. yes. Jung also talks about uh, receiving intuitive information uh, while you dream. And mm -hmm. we, of course, all know the, the famous sleeping prophet Edgar Cayce. Uh, Edgar Cayce, uh, mm -hmm. he had to lay down in order to channel information. Um, and he said he was he, he was also always, you know, connecting with Akashic records. Mm -hmm. Um, can you speak a little bit on um, uh, receiving intuitive information in our dreams? What, what Jung had to say about that? There are different ways. Um, your dreams especially are... Um, your, your unconscious, says Jung, uh, is uh, speaking a different language than your consciousness. And there are polarities. And if you are drifting away from the person that you should be, um, according to your own self then your unconscious is going to knock on the door. And the soft knock on the door is warnings in dreams. So that, that's that's the first thing. So you can get intuitions in dreams, but simply a correction of your conscious ad, uh, attitude. But um, you can also have dreams that we call a big dream, that is not only for you, but that, that give a bigger picture. There's another kind of intuition. And there are also dreams that are para uh, paranormal, that you pick up uh, things from what's going on in the world or with a certain person. So there are different types of intuitions. and it's. Uh, but if you pick up a bigger thing, then still it can be part of your own psyche. So Jung always said that if a dream is uh, paranormal, you still can do the dream interpretation because then you can ask, from all the things in the world, why has your psyche uh, decided to pick that to dream paranormal on it? Yes. So, so is it easier to receive um, intuitive information uh, while we sleep because then the, the the conscious mind is 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 not so active? We know that from parapsychology, and Jung is very much interested in parapsychology. We know from parapsychology. Uh, that most of the uh, uh, parapsychological things that that uh, that we experience are in dreams. Yes. So if if we are relaxed and um, and the conscious mind is not interfering, yes. but the 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 the, the, the unconscious uh, unconscious knowing is interfering a lot of times also during waking times. For example, in America they uh, they have statistics from the very beginning of. Uh, of, of, of actually of, of of everything, and when the railroad company started, they have statistics from the beginning of how many people were in what uh, what train, and parapsychologists found out that those trains uh, that uh, were involved in a very heavy accident with 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 death, that uh, on an average there were ten percent less people in those trains than you would expect. So unconsciously. Uncon yeah. And there there was a group of parapsychologists that uh, wanted to research that. And they said, we um, we are going to find out who should have been in that train. Uh, and uh, the, 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 those who commute to their work um, back and forth for a certain time. And they found some people who should have been in that train, but weren't. And they asked them, why didn't, wh where weren't you in that train? And one man said, what never happened, I didn't hear the clock, the alarm, and I slept. And mm. another said, I forgot my bag, miss mm. my, 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 my paper, so I had to go home and get my bag. Mm. So you can get signals in a way you don't expect. But yes. somehow the unconscious said, you don't go mm. in that train. Mm. And it's about 10 to 15 percent that we know that people are more gifted, more sensitive for those signals than other people. Yes, but it it's also shows that uh, sleep and having that time where your conscious is not so active is very important, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a researcher at the University at uh, University of Utrecht, and he did his PhD on dreams. And uh, in his research, he said if if 15 minutes before you go to sleep, you focus on a question, you focus on it, then there is a, a chance that you get information. Um, 
uh, while you sleep. Maybe not the first night, but if you just stick with it, the information will come. And this is also what, if, if you study um, the work of Edgar Cayce, he says the same thing, that mm -hmm. you know, if you really focus on, a, on, a, on something that you want an answer on, um, before, just before you go to bed, uh, really go to sleep, then you, something will try to answer that. Yeah, but even even during the day you yes. can do that. Um, but what 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 we need during the day is blank spaces that yes. that, that that you're gazing out of the window and not not being in your mind and, yes. or, or walking in the wood with your dog and not and, and not being disturbed by your telephone. That's that's yes. sh that's such a bad thing. Um, that um, if if you just give your um, it's called the white spaces. If you give your your mind a couple of times a day, just ten minutes, quarter of an hour, for those those blank spaces, just being not doing nothing, that's not a waste of time, because what happens is that your unconscious is then regrouping itself, yes. and if you are working on a problem or have a problem, you don't even need to think about it, but. Uh, somehow the, the unconscious is going to work with that during those times and all of a sudden you 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 notice that you start singing a kind of song or um uh, or thinking about a kind of book or thinking yes. about a kind of person yes. and those are little hints that look is what the text of the song is there is a kind of solution yes. those irrational things are then coming on your path yes. and help you but it must you must have moments uh, during the day that you let that unconscious go that yes. you're just in that empty space and then it then it will work during the day too yes. but so but you have to notice a little a, a, a lot more things and nowadays what i see is that people are walking in the woods just their dog yeah. is here and their phone is this yeah. and they do and they have their earplugs in they don't hear the the, the birds they don't hear uh, the, the 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 wind in, in in the trees nothing they are just absorbed in those images they are not in their blank spaces Absolutely. and so they in it, it it's taking a long time your psyche has the time but it will take 10 15 20 years and you are not able to be creative and and and, and, and bringing creative solutions to or pro to problems in your mm. life just because of the addiction to yeah, your phone it's a, it's a complete addiction and we have to you know spend more time without the the the, the smartphone uh, we have to cultivate gratitude i think be in nature those are ways to connect with the higher self the spirit yeah. the soul what is your word for it how do you do do you call it that that space where that information comes from i don't have really a word for yeah. that it's uh, um and i don't know if you if you must see it as a as a kind of space where it comes from i think that we there are so many answers that we have in ourselves yes. um but 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 to understand those answers the answers are given by your unconscious and they are very often given in an image yes. or a sound or a song or yes. and not in words and we expect it in words yes. well that's not going to work yes karen in many spiritual traditions and religions uh, the heart has been described as a source of wisdom mm -hmm. they call it the seed of the soul w w for you what what is the role of the heart in all of this that we're discussing i think that the heart energy is an is a very important energy yes. but if if you look at it from uh, um, uh from how medicine is looking at the heart that's not what i mean yes. but um i think that we have to go more to the eastern or to the indian way of looking at the heart and uh so for me uh living from your heart uh, is uh, is actually living from your soul mm. beautiful Wow, um, Karen, let's talk a little bit about the hypnosis of the mainstream media that's going on. Uh, I think some people s still have this wrong idea that we actually have a free press and we do n we do not. And I, I think it's more clear than ever now. Uh, the technology platforms are censoring everything that is not in line with the mainstream narrative. And uh, Bob Schwartz, who was on the board of Time Live and th this later became AOL Time Warner, parent company of CNN, he said, we are all in the media, we are all scribes taking dictations from the right hand of the king. The fourth estate, the free press, has been dead for decades. And I think it's more cl clear than ever now. Do, what is your experience? If you look at the mainstream media, it's it's just owned by a few companies mm -hmm. um, and they are all, yes, taking dictations from the right hand of the king. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that explains why alternative media, just like John Luca, is becoming more and more popular because people think something is not 
um, right something is off but how do you see that i mean are there still people who believe the mainstream media mm -hmm. but there are also a lot of people who are waking up and say okay you know there is something wrong here yeah the point is is that and then we come back to what jung said um power appears where love disappears that um if i make a sidestep first um they say we live in a democracy, but what is necessary for a democracy is well-informed people. So information is the first uh, victim of war. And uh, and if you uh, have the power over information, you have power over everything. And that's why the media are so important as a power instrument. And it has been of all ages, from if, if it's the Roman time or whatever, it has always been that way. So that means that as soon as uh, you have the, 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 the official media, uh, you always have to be critical. And uh, nonetheless, the people who work there uh, can be so engulfed in the system that they really think they are doing well and that they are doing at, as good as, as possible. But... Um, what we forget is that they that there are only a few sources where they get their news from. So if you own those sources, uh, you get the same news everywhere. Yeah. And we all know that eighty percent of the mainstream is owned by just a few yes. uh, through groups, a few yes. groups. And if they have uh, conflicts of interest, and if they have uh, interest in what they want to pursue then they use those media and they will subsidize it yes. uh, and they will and they will pay them a lot um but, but you know what i said this is what you see in every age every age has its own media problems but nowadays we have uh, so many platforms and media are so important that also the the, the, the people who are censored and there's the creativity of people again. Yes. Find new ways yes. to create your own media. And it's now in the beginning. You know, it's it's, it's the censorship the last two two years have has been so strong yeah. that you see that people are just going to other media, and still YouTube is one of the one the, 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 by far the biggest, and yeah. Facebook is by far the biggest. But you see that other are 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 coming. Yes. They are growing, and there will be there will come a moment that. You see that people know their way in an alternative way, and you see many young people yeah. who don't look at, uh, at at television anymore, but only on online media. But there, you also have distractions because one of the things to uh, to uh, to take care that people just follow your lines and not their lines is giving them as much entertainment as possible. Yes, distraction. And this is a distraction. Yes. And so the meta metaphors of Facebook is the newest distraction. Yes. And, and, uh, and that that's a kind of universe where you can do everything what you want and be who you are. And mm. so you're away from your everyday and then, life. And they can have all your property. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, so it's not only the media, yeah. but it's also the entertainment yes. that is in the hands of just a few. Yes. And that can be an instrument. Um, you know, in, in Roman times, there was the slogan, I give the people bread and their place yes. and, and, uh, and, uh, and they won't rise up. Yes. And it's the same now. Mm. So there will always be a, 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 a part of society that... Uh, lets itself engulf in that entertainment and in the normal media and who believe that. Yeah. Uh, but there's also a critical part. Mm. And this whole crisis we are in now yeah. has has shown that actually the, the, the big shift between the two and the, the polarization between the two. But the, 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 the problem of the media has, has actually always been a problem. Wow, yeah. Um how can we help because many people have it in, you know with, with their relatives and their family um so many people are still hip hypnotized by the mainstream media and especially now with with all the information that's coming mm -hmm. um people are fearful so they they are you know uh inclined to even listen to the m mainstream media more when they yeah. feel fearful yeah. how can we you know what can we do without trying to influence uh people too much that they you know start to see that there's another reality yeah. well the point is that within the 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 the, the common media 
there are plenty of journalists who would like to do it different. Yes. And um, so, but, but who don't get a chance or don't get subsidies for 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 their programs. Yes. So I cannot say that the whole media is 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 a problem, but the way it's organized is a problem. And uh, what you see is if people uh, are full in fear and anxiety. Uh, you have two forms of fear and anxiety. One is that uh, if there is an instant thing that happens um, that you can solve, and my example is always, if at this moment uh, there is a snake here, um, you, you, you are frightened, but then you know that you can jump away or whatever. And so there has been a short time of stress and then you can relax and you can, you can go on. Uh, but... If there is something that is unseen or too big or you don't have a grip or, or you cannot react upon, um, those are the topics like aliens or climate or a virus or whatever, then a, a, another kind of anxiety yeah, develops and that is a diffuse anxiety. And that is uh, that belongs to another part in your brain. And once that anxiety is in your brain, you cannot think critically anymore. Mm. Simply impossible. Mm. So the only thing what is possible to let people start thinking critically uh, is to take away the fear that puts them in a different brain position. But as long as the media are just making everything fearful uh, and, 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 and making everything even uh, more emotional, etc., you keep the people in fear. And that's very difficult. So talking to them and explaining them can even make them more fearful. Mm. That's one thing. So we must take into account that we cannot always uh, help them the way mm. we would like to. Mm. And um, and I think that uh, the way they want to be helped is let's get rid of the virus. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. Th that's their way. So um, instead of trying to change the people around us, we have to do what Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in yes, the world. Exactly. So we have to turn off mainstream media for ourselves and start to live from our own power instead of trying to influence or yes. change other people. And there's another thing is that Jung was um, quite clear and he did th say the things that he meant and he said, what is it in you that you want to uh, change other people? And that's a confronting thing. So what what is it in me that I want to change other people? It means that something has to be changed in myself mm. first. Mm. And once you understand that people are uh, in a different phase, a different situation, and once you can accept that that is simply how it is, and that, that there is no full light without a night. So there is always a night part for us mm. but for them we are the night mm. so so we must see that in perspective so um, what i do is that um, i see it as one of the things that i can do is just inform people um read and tell them about them in an as objective way as possible mm. uh, no blaming nothing uh, trying to understand and those who uh, who are able to be open enough mm. uh, can share it and can do something with it and those who cannot mm. um, I can only look f with love to them and mm. try to 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 to, to give it the power of our minds or the mm. power of our minds is so big mm. send them love and um, uh, wishing them all the best and uh, hoping that they, 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 they won't have too much damage and too much problems uh, because of the situation they are in. And maybe their anxiety will lift somehow. So I don't expect to reach everybody. I don't expect that I can help mm. uh, all the people. But uh, I can only offer what, what my qualities are, my mm. talents, mm. and be who I am. Mm. And I think that if people see who you are, and if people, you know, if if you meet a person who is balanced, um, uh, who is not uh, trying to prove him or herself, and who is just, uh, you feel comfortable with such a person. But there's something else. You don't need to prove yourself 
in when when you are with that person so it, your energy is free to flow towards your own self development so being a balanced person means that you give other people the chance the room and the energy to more develop themselves that's what you can give mm. them mm. and it's without words mm. and in a way it's also leading by example yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. Eckhart Tolle said if you get the inside right the outside will fall into place yes so if we work more on ourselves focus more on ourselves then we can be guiding a light for others maybe on, on a energetical level yeah, yeah. well the, actually that is what Linda Taggart does yes. with her intention experiments yes. with the power of eight and she found that if you're with a group of eight and you and you send a positive int intention so not visualizing somebody in, in distress but really visualizing a person um, fully energetic, fully healthy, fully happy, etc. If you do that, that person will feel it and maybe doesn't know what is happening, but it, it is it is creating a, a better energy for that person. But what she also found is with the groups that she is working longer with, that uh, when you are not busy with just uh, your own stuff, but just that, that love and that positiveness towards the world and toward other people that it comes back to you mm. and somehow your energy level is, is is changing so in helping others you're helping yourself yes. and i think that what we can do is not trying to reach people by saying you're wrong or this is wrong or what's this and you can't do that you shouldn't do that send the love be an example be that balanced person yourself and from that point you will slowly start healing the world. Oh, beautiful. Um, let's talk about, um, the, let's say, the agenda of the, um, the, the administrators of the world. Um, they want to get rid of fiat money, our, 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 our dollars and our euro. Um, they are working on a central bank digital currency. Um, I think one of the ways to get there is, is a total financial crash. Uh, this is one of the possible transitions transitions to to a central bank dig digital currency. Um, another thing that's happening right now is hypnotic transition, and um, this is uh, a form of transition. And this is happening right now. And it's this is through induction of fear. They can put people who are still thinking uh, critically into an artificial psychosis. And um, hypnotic transition is done in three ways: priming. Uh, programming and, and of course propaganda what's happening right now in the mainstream media um, are you not surprised by how easy it is to program the masses no it has always been that way okay it has always been that way and the point is that um, if you can reach them on an instinctual level you can easily program them and you know we are um, we are mammals and so we are animals. We forget that, that we think that we are above animals, but we are like animals. We also have instincts uh, to survive. We have an instinct uh, to to survive the, 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 the species, to survive as a person, as a group. And one of the things is that um, we are, uh, we need groups. The human being needs groups. He cannot live alone. That's from the earliest days of the existence of humanities has that been the case now what happens is that if you are left out of the group uh, in prehistoric times it meant death because you couldn't survive alone and that's what we still know not conscious but our instincts know and that means that um, people are afraid to uh, not be not being longer part of their group or a group and so they adapt to the group and there have been a lot of experiments to show how people adapt to a group and if the media create an image what is the right way of looking at things and the right way of thinking then you're going to think that oh maybe if i'm critical i'm wrong because this is everybody says because the media pretends that everybody says but it doesn't uh, and that's what um in England and in, in, in Germany has been researched by um, Noelle and I forgot her last name, but she's she she researched polls and she saw that slowly um, 
in in uh, elections uh, when elections were coming that uh, people in the beginning were thinking very different from what was shown on television and uh, in the due course they saw that they more and more grew towards what was televised and what was seen there as right and the simple thing is that that's the um she uh, she calls it the Schweiger spirale uh, is is the silent spiral that those people who think different start to keep their mouths because they are afraid of being kicked out of the group yeah. and because they keep their mouths more and more people think that they are alone in their thinking because there's nothing they, they don't talk about it anymore so that's a mechanism on an instinctual level and the media are playing a very important role in that. And that can be abused yes. by those in power. So, yes, I understand that. It's, yes. it's, it's easy. And then if you use uh, special tactics, and Joost Mirlo has written about those tactics, tactics that if you uh, constant uh, give them constant fear, then that fear keeps them in a situation in which they want to stay part of the group. That's that that that. Uh, prehistoric uh, instinct level and they want to follow a leader yeah. and if the leader says the most barbaric and strange things that doesn't matter they need a leader yeah. and uh, and so people who are critical are danger for them because as long as they feel part of the group and as long as they can look at a leader and if you say he's telling rubbish then they are going to blame you mm. because um you're taking away their security. And that's the polarization we see now. And there are a lot of other mechanisms playing a role too. Mm. But yes, I, I can see that. I can understand that. Mm. Because uh, taking a different point, um, if, 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 if we all know, for example, how dangerous face masks are and, and, and how, it's, how it deprives you from your oxygen, etc. But if you're walking in a supermarket um, without a face mask, um, people don't know how to, to react to you. Yeah. And you see people who actually would love to put their face mask off to others try to avoid you, so they don't know what to do with you. And that is, um, so it needs courage yes. to stay who you are. But those who are more balanced, who have done what Jung says, shadow work, they stay true to themselves, and they they, they can say, okay, this is the decision I take now, and I take fully the consequences mm. because this is me and this is what I want. Mm. But what you also see is that some people start to talk to you and want to know. Mm. And so you can help them. But that, that, that people uh, are for a quite a long time going with the narrative, that is known. Mm. That is known. And the point is that if you take measurement after measurement after measurement and you slow it a little bit, that, that you give them a bit more freedom and then new measurements and then a little bit of freedom again, then they are just so shaken that the resistance is broken. Mm. And, and and a real dictator works that way. Mm. That's what Mirlo describes excellent in his mm. book. So, um, and actually that's what you see at the moment happening. Mm. And from from my perspective um is it on purpose uh some people say it's it's done on purpose because those techniques are known uh, but um even even if it's not on purpose you know the point is that some of the people who are in a power position to the politicians who are in a power position can be um so uh, let, let, let's say uh, overwhelmed by uh the wrong narrative that from their perspective they are doing the right thing yes. and so it, it's very difficult to see if it's all on purpose or that people have just been caught by an idea or by wrong information yes. and there is a lot of wrong information Absolutely. and because of the uh, of, of the, the, the fact that the, the censorship is so big it's the, the, the politicians don't have the time to 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 read all the stuff and and and, and to uh, to to get all the information so they rely on what is offered to them mm. and those officials institutes are also part of those who own the media those who are in the world economic forum etc yes. so th 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 about information there is a lot of th there's a lot of problems absolutely 
Karen, they, uh, and with they I mean administrators of the world, they want a social credit system. They want a China environment with a digital ID connected to the blockchain. And everything you do and wherever you go will be traced. Everything will be programmed. With one click, they can decide where you can still spend money on. Uh, for instance, you know, meat credits. They can say you can spend no more money on meat this month. Um, if you do or say things they don't like, for instance, you say things uh, that are critical towards the government, you can lose credit in the social credit system. So this is a system of total control that they yes. would like. Um, yes. let, let's say China is close to that uh, already. Um, part of the mind control is, of course, the manipulation of scientific research. And uh, there's a few books, and one of them is How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff. Mm -hmm. And another book is uh, a wonderful book in its corporate ties that bind. Yes. The subtitle is An Examination of Corporate Manipulation and Vested Interest in Public Health. And this book is by, by Martin J. Walker. Um, they are using uh, scientific research and they are manipulating this. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're, there's even now on, um, I think, uh, Disney, there's a, a series about Purdue, and this is a company that's using uh, changing statistics in order to, to, to sell more uh, medicines, drugs that are actually opioids. So this already happened many mm -hmm. times. Um, what, you know, what is your take on all this manipulation of scientific research that's happening right now? Well, you have to go back to um, the, 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 mov the movement of technocracy. And it's it's a, it's a movement that started uh, already at the end of the 18th century with thoughts that uh, only um, scientists and bankers and uh, engineers um, uh, and, and those kind of people, they should run the world and uh, not politicians or whatever, because those people were scientific and could use scientific rules to do the things as efficient and as methodological as possible. That That's... Uh, uh, Comte de Saint-Germain start, started with that. Yeah. And so uh, kick out religion uh, because that's no use. So let's make a scientific religion. But actually, uh, from, from that moment on, you see that science has to be in service of. And, and if, I, if I skip uh, a century, because the, the, the idea stayed, uh, and we come at the end of the 19th century, then we see that some people have risen to power uh, in the banking industry. Think of J.P. Morgan, uh, for example, uh, the Rockefellers with a lot of money. Uh, they, they, they were institutes in their own and they used uh, all kinds of research. And then what you see is that if those who are that rich, if they have um, the wrong ideas and the wrong ideas in my, in my mind is not living your a potential in a balanced way, but abusing your power. And, uh, for example, uh, Rockefeller, John Rockefeller, started to understand that you could make from oil also medicines. And he had a slogan in his mind, every ill a pill. And what he did was he was, he was seen as a very nasty person because he did a lot of nasty things. The way he was, uh, he, he, he he created his wealth and his power was was just uh, uh, actually at the cost of others, and but then he made a lot of propaganda for himself, a good P PR machine. Uh, he he started his own foundation, which is very lucrative because uh, then you don't need to pay taxes. Um, mm -hmm. You you just uh, fund all kinds of things which are your, which your foundation, and it looks good. So what he started was funding universities uh, to give um, a, a, a new education in medicine and he let people uh, work for him to to create uh, the curriculum and uh, actually he changed it he kicked out herbal medicine and all those things only the only thing that still uh, that uh, uh, that was still uh, uh, yeah, possible was giving medicine now in in other days um we, if if you were becoming a doctor, you were you were studying the healing arts, and now we are studying medicine. Yes. So the word even changed, and so they they started to finance that. They started to finance studies on this on this uh, area, but also to 
to show how bad uh, herbal medicine is, etc. Yes. So there you see it starting. So as 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 soon as as money and conflict of interest come in, then you see that uh, that, that science can be abused, and in the end, uh, he he tra he transformed the whole. A way of how medicine is taught in America. There was just one way. He 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 combined everything, and that's what's still happening. So what he started is still there, and he also started the vaccine industry, yeah. and it is and, and actually Bill Gates just stepped on the train that was already running, and he mm. just joined. And this is a billion dollar industry. It's a billion dollar industry, yeah. and so you see everywhere you see that as soon as there is power and there is no empathy and it's just for the, the, to further your own glory um, then you see that uh, science can be abused yes. and there are a lot of scientists who are doing excellent work but again you have to get subsidies yes and it's and, hard and 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 it's hard yeah. and if you can get easy subsidies uh, for a certain kind of uh, research then you are happy but i know that for example that, that some of the uh, the climatologists or, or those who are oceanographists who really, really are good in their field. And it's part of what I've studied, so I can I can see that. If they, they had some criticism about climate change ideas, and they just lost their job. Oh. Now, what are you going to do? If you if you are working uh, and, you, and you love your work and you get a subsidy for something, you may maybe you don't agree with that, but you get a subsidy, or otherwise you lose your job, and maybe you can't pay your house anymore. You know these are dilemmas. We mustn't easily judge them, no. and it takes courage then to stand up and say, "No, I think it's different." And there are people who did it, but there are a lot of people who cannot. But you know, I also know from some policemen personally that they hate the situation as it is now. And that they hate uh, having to be sent to demonstrations, uh, anti-corona demonstrations, uh, because they say, I don't want it, but I lose everything. And if, if I show that I have pity with those people, then uh, other police agents are laughing at me. So they, they keep their mouth. And I can understand that because... Uh, it's so difficult. You're losing so much if you are different. And then we get that instinct level again that's playing a role. Now, if you look at those in power, once the once you have been in power with money for eight years or more, your brain is changing. We know that from neurofinance and, and neuropsychology. And you get less empathy. And then uh, that means that love is disappearing. And that means more power, more need for power comes in. Now, how can you be powerful? That is by controlling everybody and everything. Now I come to uh, 1934, and that is the technocracy movement started there, really. It was, there were already some, rim, some, some, some little movements before that, but then um, uh, the, the technocracy movement started, and um, Wood has written beautiful books on that. You really should, should read that, and you see how it's going. And the technocracy movement, uh, technocracy means uh, let us uh, rule the world of on scientific principles um, uh, and uh, taking care that there is... An, and it's beautiful, no environmental damage, that there's no loss of energy, that we take do everything as good as possible, as methodic and efficient as possible. Um, but that means that everybody has to live in the same type of house with the same type of, uh, of, of furniture, um, has the same basic income, uh, has to obey the same rules, and um, and, and we make uh, work shifts that, that there's a 24-hour workday, and so every everything is then going smooth and running smooth, mm -hmm. but you are not allowed to 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 say what you want because the education system must be must be transformed in such a way that there's only one truth and so they that's that movement and if you if you read the study guide and I really spelled it out and then you see that they wanted a 24/7 control of every movement yes. every everything that you bought everything that you did just to control the energy levels that was their idea but they didn't have the means to do that at that time. But now they have. Yeah. 
And so now they can do it with all the computers, etc., and, uh, and uh, artificial in intelligence. And at that time, at the technocracy movement beginning, their idea was uh, to, to not to work with money anymore, but with energy certificates. Yeah. And that is how much energy did you use to buy this product to travel from here to there. And if you have those certificates, then you can only uh, use so much in a month or yeah. two months. And this is what you get. And after after a couple of time, um, uh, it, it, it's it's invalid anymore. Even if, if even if you haven't used everything, it's invalid. So you every time get a little bit. You cannot save because it's becoming invalid. And they wanted control over what you did through those energy uh, oh. certificates. And what you see now is now it is actually uh, the. It's not the energy certificate, although some credit card companies already have coupled your expenses to energy. And uh, and, and if you have had too many expenses, they can just show you you are on the top of your energy. So there is that idea already. Yes. But now uh, having a digital uh, money, uh, they can combine that with what you are buying and where you are traveling, etc. So what is happening now is exactly what a technocracy uh, incorporation wanted in 1934 but uh, wasn't able to do by then and it may also means no democracy it means total control uh, it means no saying whatever uh, it means that everything is forbidden except that what is allowed to you and that's the way we are heading now yes. according to um, that to that 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 group that wants to administer the world with one world government yes. and in that group in 1973 um, the trilateral commission started and actually they picked up the ideas of the technocracy and yeah. they are involved in the Bilderberg, in the Council on Foreign Relations yes. uh, in, uh, in DAFO, in the World Economic Forum so th th what you see is that very slowly they have moved towards this point and they have, we have now the means technically to yeah. implement it. Yes, and they're moving forward and they have time to do it. Yes. Um, Karen, I have a book here and that book is uh, Super Class. Yes. Let's show it into the camera, Super Class by David uh, Rothkopf. And he describes that there are basically, let's say 6,600 people in, in, in the Super Class. And the subtitle is The Global Power Elite and the World They Are Making. And what is interesting is that only 6% is uh, women, so 94% is male. Maybe that's not a surprise. Mm. Uh, but in this book, the author describes three important pillars, and you mentioned them already. You have the Bilderberg Conference. This started in the early 50s and was initiated by uh, Prince Bernard. Um, you have the Trilateral Commission, uh, founded by uh, David Rockefeller and, and let's say Brzezinski in yeah. 1973. And then you have the World Economic Forum founded in January 1971 by Klaus Schwab. Um, Actually, that must be the fourth, the Council on Foreign Relations. Okay. That's, that's one that you really have to add. That's, that's the fourth one. Yeah, actually. That, that's yeah, yeah. actually, they were founded in 1918 after the First World War. And the, the, the members of the Trilateral Commission come from the Council on Foreign Relations. Yes. And the Council on Foreign Relations is just for America. Yes. And the Council, the the, the Trilateral Commission uh, is initially for America, Europe and Japan. Yes. And Bilderberg is for the whole world and the World Economic Forum is for the whole world. Yes. And the World Economic Forum actually is uh, implementing everything. And, is, and, and, and you can see that as the instrument for those groups just to, to, to really um, put forward their program and to, to, to take action. And, and if you look at, at the, the Bilderberg Conference, Trilateral Commission, World Economic Forum and the Council on Foreign Relations, they like technocracy, they yeah. like eugenics. Yes, um, and Marxism. And Marxism, yeah. those three things. Yeah. And you mentioned this, and, and, and let's talk about uh, the rise of technocracy. And there there's two books, Trilaterals over Washington, volume one and two, you showed yeah. um, them to me earlier by Professor Anthony C. Sutton and Patrick M. Wood. Yeah. And um, this is the documented story of the organization and members of the Trilateral Commission founded in 1973 by David Rockefeller and, and Brzezinski. And the specific purpose of the Trilateral Commission was to create a new international economic order. Yes. And 
uh, and what is behind that is a world government. One world government. Yeah, and the one world government was already older. You see, actually, you see that already as an idea at the end of the 19th century, the Fabian Society uh, found... And this is much older for the Fabian Society. Yeah, it's 1884 yeah. it is founded, and that was already heading for a one world government. Yes. And, and uh, their weapon is, I think, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes, they have two weapons. Um, they had two weapons. One day, the, 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 the wolf in sheep's clothes, uh, they skipped that one. Uh, and the turtle, they have a turtle. And the turtle says, we have the time. And it means that they, they, they were willing to wait a hundred years. But because they said, if you go as a turtle, very slowly implement a little rule and another little thing, then people keep thinking that they are in a democracy. But in the meantime, you've taken away everything and they haven't noticed. That's, that, that's the turtle, very, very slowly. And then the wolf in sheep's clothes is actually that... Um, we we, 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 we we pack it in the most beautiful words, words, but as the time is there, we are the wolf and uh, and make an aggressive step. Yes. That that was actually the, the, the idea. Now they skipped the wolf in in, in sheep clothes. Yes. You can see it in old um, uh, in old books still, yes. but um, but the, the whole idea of the turtle that's still going on and the, actually. Um, uh, mem members of the Fabian society, they were also eugenics. Yeah. Uh, they were also uh, wanting to have less, uh, a, a less yeah. population of the world. Yeah. Um, part of them are also part of the trilateral commission, or yes. uh, or are in a World Economic yes. Forum. So, uh, or in Bilderberg. So, what you see is that th those different groups uh, are partly the same people. Yes. Karen, we have here two other books by Patrick, Patrick M. Wood. And the first one is Technocracy Rising, the Trojan Horse of Global Transformation. And the other one is also by Patrick M. Wood, and that's uh, Technocracy, the Hard Road to World Order. And I, I hope they're in, 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 in the frame. Yes? Okay, great. Um, and uh, Patrick M. Wood says that the only logical outcome of technocracy is scientific dictatorship mm -hmm. um, and as already seen in dystopian dystopian literature such, such as brave new world by, by aldous huxley uh, written uh, published in 1932 and of course the famous 1984 by george orwell published in 1948 and they were all part yeah. of this movement and they were all part of the, this yeah, the, movement the, the, and, but and both, the fabian society and the fabian society yes. but both books Look straight into the face of technocracy when it was still in its infancy. Yes. But they already knew that this was going to happen. So they must have known that the technology would be available in, in the future. Um, when you see how, how quick science developed in those days, look at... Um, at the end of the 19th century, you saw really that we got a car, we had, we had trains, and, and there was such a development yes. that... Um, you could actually envision that the technology would proceed, and what what they they were part of the Fabian Society, and you meaning Huxley, Huxley and Orwell, and, oh, yeah, yeah, and Wells and others who also wrote books, yeah. their famous books. And you know what I what I tell everybody is that the Fabian Society started in eighteen eighty four, and they said we can take a hundred years. So why was the title nineteen eighty four? That actually, that, that that is because hey, they, they knew they were part of that movement, yeah. and they were fully in it. The whole Huxley family was full in it, and and what what few people know is that from the Huxley uh, family, Julian Huxley, a part of the Fabian Society, part of the Bilderberg, um, he uh, he he was part of. Um, the, the, the ones who originated the World, um, uh, World Wildlife Fund and uh, also UNICEF. Mm. He was the first director of UNICEF. And if you look at, at the, uh, the, 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 the starting guide of UNICEF, uh, it already says uh, that they have to take care that somehow uh, the world population and eugenics, uh, that we have to look very carefully at that. Um, there's also the idea of a world uh, government. So you see actually that uh, all those United Nations institutions, they are uh, already part of that 
world government movement. And what few people know is that the Council on Foreign Relations, and that's so important to know, and that, that, that's very well researched by Shoup, that, um, that uh, during the Second World War, I think about 1942 and 1943, they, they were able to, to form a group very close to the president, and worked together with the president and this they helped Jimmy the president. Carter. No, this was Jimmy Carter it was in 1973. Okay, this yeah. was during the World War, okay. Roosevelt. And they, they, and they, this group said internally that America had to become the biggest country and the most influential country after the war. And they, they, they talked about their plan and which they called the grand area, which means whatever is possible in the world, mm. we, we want to be there. Because they needed their raw materials from the whole world, and that, and they wanted everywhere bases, military bases, mm. and so they were already thinking about what they could do after the world war, world war had ended, and they actually would love loved also to have Germany on board uh, after the, the war, and also China and 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 Russia actually to be America's most dominant, and they already understood that if they, if it was America who was uh, who was working on that grand area idea that everybody would say America is an imperialist. So they said we must create an institution that looks very neutral, yeah. uh, but in which we are very influential at, at, at back doors. Yes. And that was the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So there are minutes in which they have proposed. They have made, I don't know the the, the, the English word for it, the Dutch is handfest. It is the the the, the, the the, the rules and regulations about uh, the, the United Nations is written by the Council on Foreign Relations. Mm. And the whole idea of how to set it up and how to manage is written by the Council on Foreign Relations. And they gave it to the president and the president was very enthusiastic and signed it and declared it that, that mm. the United Nations... And it was Nations Roosevelt. It was Roosevelt, yeah. yes. So and, then... and so what you see is that from the beginning, the United Nations... Uh, was had a secret purpose from the view of the Council on Foreign Relations to once become the world government. Mm. And look what's happening now. That's happening. That's happening now. That's happening so now. that was from from the beginning, even during the World War, was that. And that is that's why I think the Council on Foreign Relations is so important. And the yeah. Council on Foreign Relations first it was just a dinner club from intellectuals and yeah. and and bankers etc. But it developed in this power club in New York, yeah. and they started to to deliver uh, the, the the secretaries uh, for for the governments, no matter if it's a Republican or a Democratic government. Yes. They 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 uh, so a lot of people from the Council on Foreign Relations were. It were uh, secretaries of the government mm. and or on other high positions mm. and when the uh, trilateral commission uh, started in 1973 uh, the american members most of them were also member of the uh, council on foreign relations and the trilateral commission then also uh, gave uh, uh, the, the ministers there the, the government yes. most of the of them were uh, from the council on foreign relations and from the trilateral mm. commission yeah. and so they 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 wanted that one world government and it, it has been all along pushing that yes. idea slowly but surely yes so so the council on uh council on foreign relations uh, was founded in 1921 19, uh, 1918 they started actually okay but but the, the the real foundation was later, but the actual uh, the, 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 they came yeah. together yeah. in 1918. And one of the key figures uh, became uh, Brzezinski. Uh, yes. And he was a diplomat and a political scientist. And you you could say that he he, he was in the category of people like Henry Kissinger and Samuel Huntington. Um, yeah. He wrote a few books, and one of those books is Between Two Ages. Mm -hmm. And in this book, he explains that the world has to go to a technocracy. Uh, and a uh, one world government and uh, the, the, here you have it again technocracy marxism and eugenics and, it's, it's everything um, from the technocracy movement from yes. 1934 yeah. is actually in in a new way you know because yeah. of the war you couldn't talk about eugenics anymore yeah because so, of the nazis yeah, yeah uh, so it became a family planning yeah. and 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 it all, all yeah. the nice words yeah. but it's still the same yes. and he took all those ideas yeah. and speaks about a technotronic area yeah. and if if you look at him then his idea is actually a technological Marxist society yeah. as a final stage with a one-world government. Yeah. 
And that's the the, the basic idea that David Rockefeller loved. And so that's why they both connected. David Rockefeller went to Brzezinski and said, we must do something. And so this is how the the Trilateral Commission came into being. And this has been the goal all along. Yes. But people could say that, you know, if you really start to look at what eugenics really is, that it's, it's scary. So eugenics... Um, it's the selection of desired irritable characteristics to improve future generations, typically, of course, in reference to humans. And the term eugenics was coined in 1883 by British explorer and natural scientist Francis Galton, hmm. who was influenced by Charles Darwin, Darwin's theory of natural mm-hmm. selection. So um, Francis Galton advocated a system that would allow the more suitable races or strains of blood, a better chance of prevailing over the less suitable. Yes. Um, and so we are talking here about social Darwinism, which is basically survival of the fittest. And, you know, the, the Nazis used these ideas as well. So people would say this is, is, is scary. It is. Well, the point is, if you if you go through the end of the 19th century, yeah. Francis Galton, Darwin, and Mendel, uh, yeah. with, 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 uh, the, the whole scientific thought was was indeed that um, the survival of the fittest, but that you can also um, change the breed, as it was said, yes. um, by by selective breeding. And there were some people, some important people, who said, well, why can't we do... Uh, why why are we only doing this with cattle and why can't we do this with people yeah. and the, the, because of the, the idea the, that the survival of the fittest the, um, the those who were rich at those times they really believed that uh, they were rich because they had if you put it in modern word better genes yeah. and those who were poor they, they had lesser genes so they were worthless for society that was their idea so it was just uh, almost a scientific idea but but totally misinterpreted yes. and that means that uh, there were if, if, even people who said that we don't need to help the poor people because it's better that they are not there yes. and it was also that the, the very poor children in london um there were ships coming from america and they took away the poor children in the streets of London yeah. as slaves, yeah. and they were brought to America as slaves. Yeah. And the slavery of the, the of the white ended decades later than the slavery of the blacks. It was the slavery of the poor, and it had all to do with eugenics. Yes. And then you see the Rockefellers were very active in that eugenic movement, yeah. and they paid for a lot. Wow. And uh, and and we see really important people like the the, the, the writer Bernard Shaw, we see, uh, Wells, we, yeah. we see really important people of that time who are pro eugenics. Yes, yes. And still, what, what what you see, and and if if you look now, it the eugenics was really meant to improve humanity. Yeah. Because if you filter out those with the bad genes, then you improve humanity. Yeah. And if you have then good selective breeding, then you can improve Im- humanity even more. Now, how can we nowadays improve humanity? That is transhumanism. Yes, so that's the next step that's in the eugenics. Next step. Yeah. It's actually the next step and, and in eugenics. And that's really what, what Klaus Schwab is advocating uh, in, in, on television. But, but, but by World War I, many scientific authorities and political leaders supported eugenics. And then, of course, it ultimately failed because of the fact that the Nazis used eugenics to support Actually, the extermination of entire you know, races. Hit- Hitler did send a delegation to California yeah. to learn how to do it. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it, it's incredible. So, um, Brzezinski wrote Between Two Ages, um, again, a technocratic society, one world government, and then David Rockefeller really loves the book and he wants to help realize the technocratic yeah. society and the one world government, and then they start the trilateral uh a commission, commission and they pulled Jimmy Carter in their sphere of influence. Uh, and actually, from that moment on, yeah. every president has been in their sphere of influence, except for Trump. Except for Trump. That's yeah. why he was firing so many people yeah, because they were exactly. connected to the trilateral commission. Yes, yeah. yes. As soon as he saw yeah. that they are going yeah. against what he wanted, yes. he fired them. Yes. yes. Yeah. So tr- Trump was aware of this. So so members. Um, of the Rockefeller family are more visible in crucial positions than, for uh, instance, uh, the the Rothschilds. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I could also argue that, you know, the Rothschilds are Jews, that the Rothschilds like eugenics not so much, given the fact that the Nazis were proponents of eugenics. Or is that not a factor that is in play? Nee, no, that isn't. You know, the, the point is that it's not bound to being a Jew or not a Jew. Okay. Uh, but but it, it's the idea of improving human race. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that 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 is uh, an idea that is in both camps. Yeah. And they, the Rothschilds are uh, are on the background, yes. but they are very important investors yeah. uh, in all the industries that um, of, of which some of them are also uh, in in the eugenetic field and the yes. transhumanism field, yes. etc. Okay, so so let's talk a little bit about the Rothschilds because we're talking more about the Rockefellers. The Rothschild dynasty started, let's say, in 1800 in Frankfurt. And they started from humble beginnings. Uh, yes. You know, they are a very, very young dynasty. And we could say that uh, they made their money through financial, through wars. They made their money financing wars. Um, and um, one of the people that was not a friend of the Rockefellers was Napoleon Bonaparte, yes. Yes. who wanted to change things, who wanted to get rid of, uh, of the elites, uh, I think, in his time. And of course, he, he, he crowned himself emperor, so maybe that's a little bit of a contradiction. But um, in history books, Napoleon has been described as a dictator. But if you start to look at his intentions, Napoleon actually was trying to do some good, I think. Well, that's that's from the Book of Gold. Yeah. Uh, and a central banker from South Africa who has studied the history of central banking was giving that story. And what you see is that um, actually... What I would like to stress is that um, everything, every measure has a shadow side. Everything that the government decides has a shadow side. What did Europe in that time? What Europe in that time did, that was the Jews were not allowed to, to function in, uh, um, in, in, in special uh, occupations. They, they were not part of, of, the, of, of the whole society. So the Jews were forced to live in their own quarters and they were hardly allowed to participate in society. The only thing that they were allowed to do was just working with money. So what we see is that Europe itself is at fault because they gave them the opportunity to, bec to become masters in money. Yeah. And if you deny a person power or a group power and it, it, it gets an instrument that it can use to get power, it will improve its situation. And that is what happened if you look at an objective way. So that they became masters of money and, and, all, and, and, and they were very smart. So they found all kinds of ways. As such, that's okay. Yeah. But then, um, then becoming rich, they, they, they started to see how they could make m even more money. Yeah. And there the shadow sides comes in yeah. because from that moment on, they started to... to, to uh, actually um, talk to kings uh, to get into war because yes. as soon as a king gets to war they have to lend moral yeah. they have to borrow money and who can give them the money that's other road shield right. so they became powerful yes. in, 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 in but they also became powerful in central banks they became yeah. powerful other other places yeah. and um and and they they had such a good information system because the Jews were everywhere in the world yeah. and they had to, their own people traveling to each yeah. other. So they often had more inf earlier the information of, about what was going on in the world than others. Yeah. And so you see that because of they were shattered everywhere in the yeah. world, because of they were denied so much, they became the, the top people in the financial world. Because they had no other space. To they they had no other space. So that's yes. actually what Europe itself did. And then uh, because they... Um, they became they became they became a kind of shadow side yep. because of that instigating wars and that was what napoleon didn't want yes. and in that time it was normal to be crowned as a king or emperor because otherwise the, pe the people wouldn't follow you that was the system at that time yep. and that but the people loved napoleon yep. and uh, napoleon said to um, to the rothschilds I'm not going to borrow money from you. I'm going to reform uh, the, 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 the payment system, etc., because I want the people to have a good income and, and a good living. And that is, of course, so the, the, the Rothschilds didn't have a, a grip on France. Yeah. And they had a grip on England, on, 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 on the different uh, kingdoms in Germany, etc. 
and and they didn't want it. They wanted a grip on France, and so they are the ones who set up the other kings against Napoleon. But the winner is always the writer of the history books. Of course. Yeah, that's true. And so Napoleon is now seen as a dictator. Yeah. But maybe we have to rewrite the history. Absolutely. Um, we talked about um, uh, eugenics and we said you tra transhumanism is the next step. And we have people like Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk, very well known. He's, I think, the richest man in the world right now. He's got Tesla, SpaceX. And he says the only way to survive is to merge with artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is going to be a big threat in the future. And, you know, you, um, you have um, singularity the moment that, mm. let's say, artificial intelligence becomes more aware and intelligent than humans, and then they can take over. And he says the only way to prevent that is to merge with AI. Is he also um, working for the transhumanism slash uh, eugenics moment, uh, movement, or is he right about that? No, um I think neither of them. I think that um, he is a very uh, strange person, has very uh, strange ideas, very creative, yeah. uh, uh, and a difficult personality at the same time. Uh, I don't think that he is really the person who is an instrument for AI, etc., because he himself uh, believes this, and it's from himself, as far as I can see as an outsider, of course. Um, but there's one thing that they all, all overlook. We are living in our Western paradigm and that can only think in terms of uh, improving our cells, improving our brain. And they, they simply have no clue how great our brain is, how powerful our thoughts are, how powerful our mind is. And our soul. Um, and our soul. And that, that n they, there will never, ever be a, a robot that will get the soul of a human being. Yeah. And it, it, a robot has no chakras. Um, like, it, like Pinocchio, you know, he wanted to be a real boy, and but he never had the soul. That's what he wanted. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. but but the, 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 the point is, is that as long as we are l looking at this very narrow stuff and not taking into account what a tremendous great creatures human beings are, if you live your full potential, if, if you... If you use that that power of your mind um then ai isn't a threat yeah. and you can improve yourself you know if if i look at some of the tibetan monks um who can um uh, in, in the middle of the snow they can heat themselves that the steam yeah. comes from their body look at wim hof the yeah. iceman yeah. look what we can do with the power of our mind you can walk on fire there's so much possible yeah. and our soul is we, we are so connected with the cosmos that if you only can think technologically, you see improvement only on yeah. a technological field. But that's not us. No. That's not who we are as a human and being. That's not our real potential. No, it's yeah. not our real potential. Um, Karen, of course, the elephant in the room right now is the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is an effort to rethink the global economy. And the slogan of the technocracy and the slogan of the Great Reset is that in 2030, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Um, and this is not a conspiracy, no, you know, this, because it's scantily spoken about and explicitly stated. So that's not it's a conspiracy. Their, it, it, that's it's, that's an agenda. It's but, in their own movies yeah. of the World Economic Forum. Yeah, but if you in, in 2030 is uh, in eight years from now, we're yes. almost in 2022. Then uh, you know, in order to to own nothing and be happy about it, you have to be completely mind controlled. How do you see that? Um. The point is that look what is happening now due to the lockdowns. Yeah. How many people cannot survive? Uh, how many people are losing their business and are full of debt? So there is now a movement to forgive your debt. Yeah. And and then ca you, you can stay living in your house. And that's, that's the idea. You can still uh, travel through a car, but everything is not yours anymore, but you can still use it. And so... Um, that's the idea, that you still can have a living, that you have your basic income, uh, that you have a house, that you have a car, uh, that, that you can work, and you have no debt. Now, that sounds very positive for people. But having no possessions means that you are forever dependent. Yeah. And so they're creating uh, on purpose a dependency 
uh, to fulfill this agenda. And there are some people uh, who, whose voices are silenced and those are not 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 conspiracies, but these are professors, etc., who warn that this is part of uh, that, that the lockdowns are also part of uh, this movement just to break uh, the middle class uh, to fulfill this ag agenda. And uh, and uh, I, if you have nothing, but you have no, um, if you have uh, no debts anymore. Actually, that is the idea, again, from the study guide of technocracy in 1934, where they say that everything is owned by the collective, yeah. which actually means the elite, yeah. and everybody has a house, everybody has furniture, yeah. everybody has food, everybody has an income, yeah. so they must be happy. But, you know, if you look at it, the part of the study guide is talking about how the technocrats look at human beings and they see human beings as the dogs of Pavlov yeah. and that you can program them and that almost robot like. Yeah. And that's not a human being. That's not our creative potential. No. And that that's absolutely going to revolt. It will not revolt in everybody because there will always a group of people who say, this is nice. I don't need to do that much and I have my income, etc. Mm. But most people will feel the knock on the door inside yeah. of their creativity. And there are always people who find creative ways just to escape the rules. Look at what is happening now. That's yes. still there. And so more it, creative, it, yeah. it, they are not going. It is, and if I then look at um, the times that are coming astrologically, um, which we get a totally different mindset in a positive yeah. way, uh, in which the individual creativity will be more important. Yeah. Uh, that that's in a couple of years that will unfold more. Yes. Then when I look at that, then I see that you cannot sit in your home saying, "Okay, I have a basic income and I'm enjoying Netflix and nothing else." Yes. You know, it, it's not going to work. But yes. because they have the wrong ideas about what a human being is, yes. they don't have an idea about the soul. Yeah. They have no idea about spirituality. Yes. It's 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 all kicked out. Yeah. Uh, science has to be the re the religion, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the scientist, the priest. You know, um, it's such a revolt against what yeah. a human being really is, what a soul really is, what your inner authenticity really is, yes. what your creativity yes. is, what the power of your mind is. It's simply not going to work. Wow. So so in, in closing, let's talk about a little bit more about why you are convinced that they will not be able to reach their goals. But first, of, first, uh, I would like to address this, that, you know, there I think there are three, three big cards they, they, they can play in order to achieve total control and a one world government. One is climate change. One is the virus that's happening right now and there's also another card and werner from brown wa warned about this uh, a fake alien invasion possibly that's another card they can play let's mm. say a 9 11 but then it's an from, alien invasion yeah. and if if you look at what's happening in the media it seems that they're priming us a little bit already for hey yes, yes uh the pentagon has released video footage and information mm -hmm. that there actually are ufos and and mm -hmm. etc yeah well the the, the main rule of uh, of uh, a very important rule of the uh, trilateral commission is keep people in fear yeah and so a, a part of the people will stay in fear that is simply what it is but um it it the fact that um it's so against human creativity as i said is that uh, those who are in fear they have also um they they create less antibodies against illnesses etc so it's it's really also a bodily thing um they will have a really hard time yeah. but those who are creative what what i said they will find ways yes. and um the soul will find the, the ways. soul will find yeah. ways and there is something else that i that i expect and that is that uh, some of the things will turn against them yeah. because uh, the whole agenda of climate climate change is that we are getting uh, so hot that the earth cannot bear it. But the point is that in Roman times, it was, uh, if I remember well, but one of the times I saw the Roman times, it was hotter on earth than now. Yeah. And if you look at all the civilizations and you, you look at the temperature on earth, yeah. Um, and we we can we, we we can reconstruct those temperatures. If you look at the temperatures on Earth and civilizations, what you see is that if we had high civilizations, temperature on Earth was high, mm. and when the civilizations broke, 
when temperature was was low. low. And what you see now is that um, there is a direct correlation, yes. um, a scientific correlation between the solar uh, spot cycles and temperature on Earth. Yes. And it's, you can also explain why there is that correlation. Yeah. Even the NASA says that there is a correlation. But the strange thing is that we are now entering an almost spotless uh, period that can take decades. Yeah. And in all the historic times, yeah. we see that spotless sun or just very few sunspots means that the temperature is dropping several degrees, the average temperature. Yes. And we have had a little ice age. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you look at the paintings at that time, you see them skating on the th on the yeah. Thames, etc. Yeah. And so, and we are now entering. It, it started already yeah. in that uh, low sunspot phase, yeah. taking decades. This means that the tendency is in the direction of colder. Yeah. So the thing is that they have totally misjudged the the, the creativity and the spirituality of the human soul. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, it seems that they have misjudged the climate situation. Uh, so I'm curious what's going to happen in the next five years. Yeah. And uh, they have misjudged also the way uh, things were going with uh, the whole uh, virus situation. And what you see is that uh, we are now entering a period where they, where they want to try everything just to keep the narrative going. But... Uh, I see already that there uh, are holes in the narrative. And if you look at the astrology at the moment, yes. we see that we are ending a, a, a couple of years of fear and we have been in a very, very difficult situation that is, I've never seen in, um, in the whole astrological history uh, a combination we have had in 2020. We have had three planets, Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto, together on one point. And that is that's happening only seven times in a thousand years, wow. and for the first time, it was in that little part of the of the zodiac um, where what we call the dictator degrees. So that that, that was so when I saw that coming already years ago, I warned my students, and with the financial crisis, I said, um, "Just wait, the worst still has to come because that was this." So we are now at a point. Uh, that is more important than we think. And I just, it's a point uh, for which I have to go back two and a half thousand years. And why? Because that was the Greek time. And in the Greek time, we had Plato. I've already talked about him. And Plato said, uh, the only thing that is real in the, in, in the world isn't real because the real reality is behind that, what you cannot see. So the unseen world is actually the most important. And his student, Aristotle, uh, said the opposite. He said, the only thing you can do is studying the world and nothing else, because the unseen you can see. So it was actually an idea of uh, the unseen versus the seen, the mind versus matter. And it has a, been a polarity for two and a half thousand years. Yes. And what you see is that uh, at, at periods in time, Plato was more important and then Aristotle came and then Plato, Aristotle. it has never been combined. And what you see now is that in the last century, we see that we have been diving so deep in the world of matter. But at the same time, those who were diving deep came on quantum level. And there you see that things happened that you couldn't explain in a material world. And... Then you see Fritjof Capra, uh, Gary Zukov and others who came actually to the conclusion that there is metaphysics in science. Yes. And uh, the, the, the book, The Tao of Physics, etc., The Dancing Wuli Masters, yeah. they're brilliant books to read. So what you see is that uh, actually science itself starts to discover spirituality. Yeah. It means that matter starts to discover the world of the unseen. Yes. And what is happening now in this time where this triple conjunction, this, this very difficult uh, situation in heaven that we've seen, is actually the final breakpoint that we cannot continue 
with a society, with a, with a paradigm that keeps matter and spirit separate. Yes. So it's going to merge. Yes. And this is the beginning, this time yes. of the blackness in the world and all these dystopian things. This is the beginning, this is the birth of the combining of the feminine and masculine, of spirit and matter. Mm. And we are, the, we are the persons who have to give birth to that. But mm. that's, that's the development and that's why I'm so absolutely hopeful. So then the, the, the spirit, the soul, the higher self, oneness will win. Yes. And we have to shift to a holistic approach. Yes. Uh, and, and it will grow and it will grow slowly. But look at everywhere are people connecting now. Yeah. And they are not connecting about the basis from how much can you fund, yeah. but it's um, how can we together make another kind of society. Yeah. That's what's happening now. So you see everywhere those little things and the fact that what I told, like, like Lynn McTaggart already, working with the power of eight, if I look at Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton and so many others yeah. that that are already preparing this way. And so I think that once we are crushed through what is going on, crushed in a way that uh, the economic World Economic Forum wants the Great Reset, I think we are going to another great reset. Yeah. And that's the, the reset of spirit and matter coming together, yeah. the masculine and feminine coming together and creating a new society. And it yeah. takes maybe decades. It doesn't matter. Yes. We are part of this birth. Yes. And is this also happening because you mentioned this, that the Saturn-Pluto cycle will, will end at the end yeah, of this the, year? This, this, the Saturn-Pluto cycle, you have every couple of years, you have that they come together. Yeah. And then in those times, people are more easily fearful and you can and and if you sell them fear they will feel more fearful mm -hmm. but that's ending um at actually at the end of this year and that means that um if you want to make people fearful it's not not gonna work that well anymore as it did yes. Yes. so there's there are several things that are going to change but of course the old uh, the old structure will not give in that easily. Mm. So it, it, it means that it may be a very difficult time still ahead. But, but don't worry. Yeah. Work on, if you work on yourself right. to, to, to bring spirit and, 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 and matter together, live in this world the fullest, but, but be spiritual, yeah. then, you're, then you're part of the creation of yes. that new society. Yes. And actually the shift to the oneness perspective, to the soul, to the higher self, is actually being accelerated by the World Economic Forum, the Trilateral Commission, by people like Klaus Schwab and, and, and Bill Gates. They are actually accelerating our evolution, yes. um, right? Well, that, that's what Jung calls the principle of the enantodromia, yeah. which means that everything turns into its opposite. And if something has been yeah. very much in uh, going one way, and this is the, that one-sided masculine way of thinking that we have, and material way of thinking we have been in, then all of a sudden it will just jump to the other side and that the, the period in between is the forces of dark it is chaos and that's where we are in but yeah. we are jumping to the other side yes it's so beautiful you mentioned the dancing woolly masters um by, by gary zukov after the dancing woolly masters he wrote uh, the seed of the soul yes. and in the seed of the soul um he talks about two kinds of powers one is external power and we've been talking about that extensively uh, today uh, external power is, let's say, power over, trying to have power over. But there's also another kind of power that he speaks about. And this is authentic power. And authentic power is when your personality makes the conscious decision to start serving the energy of the soul. And when you can create, uh, uh, when you're creating authentic power, you start to um, manifest the intentions of your soul you, 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 the intentions of your soul you start to identify what does my soul want instead yeah. of what does my personality want and what's happening right now i think with the people who are in power they're working from the ego uh, the personality but there is an answer from other people who are saying oh, no we will work from the soul now we will connect with our soul mm -hmm. now and that's really interesting and in a way you could say and maybe you don't like to use this world that this is a spiritual war that's going on oh yes it is yeah it is Karen, um, in A Tale of Two Cities, uh, there's a quote, this is the worst of times, but this is also the best of times. And I think that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Um, but um, it really warms my heart to see that you're so positive because I'm very positive of what, uh, as well because we have a great opportunity here to make a leap to our soul, to our higher self. Yes. 
Um, and this is actually, I think, part of our um, human and spiritual evolution, what's happening right now. It's we are growing up as, a, as, as humanity and that's what's happening. I want to thank you so much for comparing notes, uh, for for having us here in your beautiful library, your sanctuary. It was an honor and privilege to be able to spend time with you this way. And um, I hope we, you, you know, can keep up this important work that you're doing. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank Karen. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.